Hi, everyone, and welcome to Shoeforia, the podcast where footwear myths are made and broken. I'm Simon Barthold, your host, and this is episode five of Shoeforia. I have got a banging podcast for you today with a man who quite rightly is known as a legend within the footwear industry. It's not often you get the chance to chat with someone who worked with not only Phil Knight of Nike, but also Bill Bowerman on actual projects, a man who was the director of the Nike Sports Research Laboratory and who has reinvented himself as what he likes to call a recovering academic to now contribute enormously to the world of athletic footwear um, and uh, inventions uh, across the whole spectrum of athletic footwear. In today's podcast, we are going to be exploring many sacred cows, and there is no doubt that my guest has very strong opinions on many different subjects. He's going to uh, discuss his point of view that the concept of overpronation and indeed motion control in athletic footwear was in fact an idea that was borrowed from classical podiatry and that it simply should be dumped if not become unlawful. Uh, A man who thinks after my own heart, I love that. He's also trying to understand highly complex uh, biomechanical concepts. For example, how you could possibly quantify the subtalar joint axis, which of course is highly variable across subject populations. He's also uh, very interested in exploring the midfoot, in particular the medial longitudinal arch, as being far more important to study than looking at the rear foot. And he also has told me today that he thinks that uh, measuring rear foot movement of a shoe is in fact a complete nonsense. I'm very proud to uh, introduce you to my guest for today. His name is Dr. Martin Shorten and he has a massive CV. I can't read that out to you, but I'm going to read the short bio because it will give you some idea of where he sits in the pantheon of the biomechanics greats. He received his PhD from Loughborough University in the UK in 1984 before starting his own business in 1992. He was employed as director of the Nike Sports Research Laboratory and also uh, worked as the director of design research and product development for Puma globally. Martin's been active in sports-related research and product development since 1978, and his primary focus is on applying biomechanics research to the development of safety and performance-enhancing products. While Martin's basic and applied research has won him great international recognition, he's in demand uh, around the globe as a keynote speaker at conferences. He is, as I said, what he calls a self-styled recovering academic, and he prefers to use his science and technology knowledge as tools for developing applications and products. He's a frequent author and invited speaker on topics related to biomechanics and human performance and injury, and their links to athletic footwear, sports surface, sports equipment design. He now has his own company, which is called Biomechanica, and it's a consulting company to the industry. It provides research, development, and uh, testing services to leading athletic shoes and sports surface manufacturers, and he's an accomplished inventor with over 11 patents to his name. For 10 years, from 2008 until 2018, Biomechanica hosted the Runner's World Shoe Lab, and Martin Shorten was the magazine's technical editor providing test results for shoe guides and other science support for the magazine's publications in 18 countries. He's also a co-founder and former president of Skydex, which is a Denver-based company that manufactures high-performance impact attenuating materials for military, sport, and other applications based on technology he developed along with others. So he, it would be fair to say that he is a very well-rounded individual. He has many different interests, And I think you are going to really enjoy this podcast, and you're certainly going to get a lot of information, a great deal of it completely new, and some really interesting biomechanics discussions. So welcome to Shoeforia, Episode 5. I'm Simon Bartold. I hope you enjoy it. You're listening to the Shoeforia podcast by Bartold Clinical. Listen in as we delve deep into the world of evidence-based sports science, sports medicine, and athletic footwear science. Let's go and bust some myths. 
So, I have with me this morning a friend of mine and a very distinguished and eminent biomechanist, Dr. Martin Shorten. Martin, thank you so much for taking your time all the way from Portland, Oregon. Welcome to Shuforia, our little podcast. <laughs> um, <laughs> Martin, uh, Martin and I have known each other for a long time, and I guess our main claim to fame is that we both have a band that plays at conferences. It's a little bit like the Beatles and the Rolling Stones and that sort of creativity. His band is called the Iliotibial Band. My band is the world's oldest boy band. It's called the Tarsal Coalition. But every now and then, Martin and I pick up the guitars together. He's a much better player than I am, but we have a bit of fun. Yes, so, so we're not here to talk about guitars and bands, Martin. We're here to talk about, well, you really. And I'm actually, the first question I want to ask you is something I've actually never talked to you about. And when I was thinking about what I wanted to ask you, I'm really intrigued to know about your early career with Nike, because you must have been at Nike in an incredibly interesting and exciting period. And I, I'm just really interested to hear from you, first of all, what you did. I know you were at the Nike Sports Research Lab, but also what it was like being with that brand as it was really starting to gather some steam. Well, I think the biggest difference compared with now, where there are now thousands of employees, you know, we had uh, the research lab and design, marketing, sales, the sample room, and everything, all in one small building, a single story building. And so we could, we were just walk out the door of the lab and we'd be there in the middle of the design group. And two paces to the left, we'd be there with the marketing group. So it was a small group and it was an exciting time because it was during that time, I was there at 85, 89, as when we basically put together the whole, or well, two things, the whole like visible air. And at that time there was a marketing manager who was, who was concerned that this about this technology. He said, well, why can't I see it? I wanted to see this technology, this airbag technology. So a lot of people, you know, a lot of Mark Parker, Tom McGurk especially, but a lot of people were kind of involved with putting together those visible air shoes. And when we first took them to the Super Show in Atlanta and started showing the world these things, it was kind of a lot of, a lot of excitement. Yeah. yeah I can, whole, I can. The whole Just Do It plan went on with it and went alongside it too. Yeah. That was also the, when we set up a, you know, during that period, we set up a kind of a, we kind of did a big update of the lab itself and got in a lot of, uh, you know, went from video cameras to 3D and, uh, from fourth place to pressure distribution and these other things. So it was an exciting time and it got to work with uh, a lot of really good people. Yeah, it's, it's interesting you mentioned that the Super Show. I, I remember I only ever went to one. It was pretty early on and I remember two things about it. It was like a record cold snap in uh, Atlanta mm -hmm. and I, I also remember the Nike booth at that time. The Nike booth was absolutely massive and I can remember walking down a corridor and just seeing shoes spinning in space between two opposing magnets and it was, uh, it was a very, <laughs> very, very cool thing actually. Yeah. But um, yeah. yeah, so that's a really interesting period you were there. Did you get to work with Phil Knight at all? I mean, was he part of the scene? No, was he pretty ha hands on? I, I yeah. actually get to work on a project with Bill Barman. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah, on a related to the Oregon track, you probably believe. But Phil was around. He was accessible. Yeah. And you know, we'd, see, we'd see him now and then. He'd be at parties. And yeah. he wasn't a stranger by any means. Yeah, obviously I never got to meet Bill Bowman, but he comes across as a, a fairly crusty uh, character who possibly didn't tolerate fools all that well. Is that Would that be a fairly accurate uh, perception? Well, I'm not a fool, so I got tolerated quite well. We worked well together. But yeah, I think that's fairly accurate. I got on well with him. I liked him, and I think he's a he was a very smart guy. He did not buy into the hype of the whole yeah. brand thing, which made him seem to many to be even more crusty. Yeah, exactly. So, Martin, I'm very intrigued to hear your thoughts on the Nike Sports Research Laboratory, which you were involved with and was started up by our old friend Ned Frederick. Um, but that must have been a very interesting time in your life to be involved with that. Yes, it was. I wasn't there at the beginning. Ned set up the first lab in Exeter, New Hampshire in 1980. I didn't join up until 1985, which coincided with when Ned left and the lab moved to the West Coast to Beaverton, Oregon. But yes, it was exciting. It was in an old wooden building in Exeter, New Hampshire, next to a shoe factory, basically. And they had some good things going on for that time of the, you know, for that era in our business. They were doing you know, large scale foot morphology studies, photogrammetric studies of people's feet and incorporating that into last. They were doing work on mechanical cushioning systems. They were doing work on or work on running economy and the energetics of running in shoes or the effects of shoes. So there was some, it was a small crew, but uh, 
very good one. It included Gordon Valiant, who you know. Tom Clark and Mark Parker were both part of the lab at that time. And they both went on to become presidents of Nike, of course. Yeah. But I joined and Ned recruited me towards the end of his time as head of the lab. And I joined up in 1985, but when the new lab was being built in Oregon. And in my time there, we kind of updated it and you know, went from 2D video to 3D motion capture, added in the new pressure measurement technologies were coming in at that time. And so we kind of updated that, the lab in that period, which is kind of exciting. Yeah, so there's a number of really interesting things that come out of that short commentary. Um, the first is the starting date, 1980. I wasn't aware it was that early, but that's really not that long after Blue Ribbon Sports became Nike. So that, to me, demonstrates a pretty fair commitment from Nike to research. Absolutely. I, I'm, <laughs> I'm pretty intrigued by that succession of people working in the lab like Mark Parker going on to become president. So that's probably quite good news for Matthew Nurse, yeah. who's currently head of the, head Tom of the Clark Nike. Too. Tom and Clark. Tom Clark, yeah. 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 Exactly, yeah. But one of the most interesting things about your comments there is that way back then, Ned and you guys were looking at energetics. And I had cause to revisit one of Ned's papers very recently from way, way back looking at this. And those guys were way ahead of their time. I mean, they were talking about stuff that really has only become quite visible since Roger Cram's been uh, publishing on this quite recently. So they were way ahead of the curve, really. I think so. And another key thing that they were that they figured out early on was the whole idea of kinematic adaptations that you, know, you change a shoe, you don't necessarily see changes in the external mechanics, but you see adaptations, you see changes elsewhere in the body, not necessarily ground reaction forces. So you know, one classic is you put somebody in a harder shoe, the ground reaction force doesn't change, but stride step frequency might, or the stiffness of the leg might change reflexively in order to compensate for the presence or absence of cushioning under the foot. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's super interesting. That's stuff. One, of, one of the mechanisms how that results in a shoe having an effect on energy expenditure. Yeah, well, that probably leads quite nicely into some of the other work that you've done. Martin's published extensively over the years, but he's written some very interesting stuff a little while ago now, talking about the effect of cushioning and general misunderstanding of how this affects ground reaction forces, FZ1 in particular, the vertical yeah. impact. And yeah, you've written a couple of papers that are pretty much my go-tos about this, explaining some of the misconceptions of the effect of cushioning on these. Do you want to run us through that very quickly, Martin? Yeah, it's very really quite simple. I think we, you know, we, when researchers first started looking at ground reaction forces during running, they saw two peaks, one at the beginning and just shortly after heel contact and another in the middle of the stance. And, uh, you know, they were labeled basically the impact peak and the propulsive peak. Well, it turns out that the impact peak is not the impact. It's actually due to something else. Part of the problem here is that the force plate isn't measuring local loads. It's measuring the, basically the, it's responding to the acceleration of the center of mass. So everything is kind of multiple signals combined in that ground reaction force, how you place the center, how you wave, if you're waving your arms and other things that also influence that, the shape of that curve. But both Evolt Hennig and I observed that the that initial peak doesn't happen until the foot is flat on the ground. Hmm. And it is a consequence of the stiffness of the stiffness of the leg changing as you transition from, you know, that initial heel contact to a flat foot contact. And it includes things that are neither heel, not, so that peak includes things that are not heel, and it also includes things that are not impact. They're at the slow, low frequency motion of the body as it's kind of adapting to the ground is a big component of that. And if you take out the forefoot component and take out the heel component, there's really not much left. And it's unrelated to how much of a peak there is in the observed ground reaction forces. So if, so, I, understand, if I understand that correctly, you're saying that this very simplistic model of the double peak time versus force plot we see commonly represented, it doesn't include things like inertia or, shall we say, momentum in that particular model. Right, right. and nor is it localized. It's localized <laughs> at the center of mass, not at the heel or the forefoot or anywhere, you know. So, so what happens then is that the, you know, cushioning, the ways that cushioning works is that in terms of impact attenuation is it spreads an impact out over a longer period of time so that the peak is lower. And that means the peak is also delayed. Mm -hmm. If you think there are just two components, there aren't many, but let's just think there are two. One is that initial contact event, and then there's the main body of the big pulse that has the second peak. Well, if the first one is delayed by cushioning, it's going to add into a higher value of the second peak. Mm -hmm. that second pulse. 
which means as you get softer, it's going to get more delayed, and that first peak is going to get higher. Mm-hmm. Whereas you might intuitively think that from cushioning, it gets lower. And it does. If you just look at the high-frequency heel components, yes, it does go down, as you would predict. But this, that anomaly has led to all kinds of false conclusions about how cushioning doesn't work and how you know it's running shoes are a scam and all that kind of stuff, which is just because people haven't thought about it that rigorously or challenged the assumptions that are made about that. They've just made the assumption that that peak equals heel impact and it should be work at, you know, shoes should make a change in this way without actually understanding the underlying mechanics. Yeah, and of course, that was something that was trotted out a lot during the barefoot running discussion. And, um, you well, know, there's you, another you, problem with that, too. With the barefoot, there's, a, there's another problem, with the, another myth. So I, you, I've seen several papers where they have claimed a reduction in ground reaction force by, and they've got some shoes and they've got barefoot, and they show the whole profile of the ground reaction force during the contact period. And indeed, the barefoot trace is lower and has a lower peak than the one in shoes. Mm. And I don't. I think that that data is good. But what they're not doing, what they're doing is showing these forces as a function of contact time. Yeah. It's percent of contact time. And in the real world, that reduction could not happen because the impulse over a whole step cycle has to be balance out gravity, which it doesn't do if that peak gets lower. But by, so what they really saw was an increase in step frequency in the barefoot case, which causes a shorter contact time and a lower peak force, which is an ad- one of these adaptations I was talking about that you know, is actually an accommodation of the higher loads produced in uh, barefoot running. Yeah, I mean, that's super interesting. There's been so much scrutiny of this, and I guess one of the questions that I would have for you, so there's been quite a bit of focus or, or discussion about the loading rate, which for those of you that are not 100% familiar with force versus time plots for ground reaction forces or the vertical component, the loading rate is the steepness of the curve up to the first peak basically so the question for you here is or the key question is is impact attenuation should that be our main focus or are we looking in in the wrong spot here in relation to protective components in athletic footwear my opinion might be a little bit controversial especially since i've done so much work on cushioning and impact and but that includes my work on impact and cushioning includes things like uh, military helmets and football helmets and surfaces and body protective gear and even you know impact attenuating blast protection layers for the underside of humvees and there we are talking about impact shocks of you know hundreds of g's with the, the human body during running we are talking about 2 or 3 g's between two and three body weights. And of those two and a half Gs, one of them is your body weight. It's just, you get that standing still. Mm -hmm. So these are very, very low. And in any other world, they would not qualify as impacts. So I think it just, now cushioning is important for other reasons, but most injuries, there are some injuries like metatarsalgia, maybe some heel and arch pain that can be related to you know, direct contact between the foot and the ground. But most of those are not impact injuries. Impact injuries are instantaneous. They are overuse injuries. Mm-hmm. Once you get above the ankle, most of the overuse injuries, in my view, they tend to occur in places where muscles are pulling on bones. Yep. And are, and again, they are overuse injuries. So that load is important, load reduction is important, but that impact itself is, just looking at impact attenuation alone is not necessarily the path to success. Yeah. So if I posed a very simplistic question, which I'm pretty sure I know how you'll answer this and just said, well, is cushioning therefore simply a uh, a comfort factor? I'm pretty sure you'll say no, because I think you'll probably say no, cushioning has some significant energetic component to it. But I'm answering these questions for you. What are your thoughts? Well, yeah, both of those things are true. Cushioning is important for comfort and it's also important for energetics. But also we are, you know, we're talking about impact being the distribution of load through time to get lower loads. Cushioning is also important in the sense that it reduces the local loads in space, spatially on the plantar surface of the foot. If we're barefoot, we would load naturally concentrates underneath the bony prominences of the heel and the metatarsal heads. Mm -hmm. And both loading of the body and that localized loading is what causes things like the metatarsalgia and so on, and these foot related localized foot injuries that are load related. But, you know, cushioning spreads those out and reduces peak pressures and relieves those loads. Mm-hmm. So, I, you know, I think of, of the, the pressure redistrib- or the load redistribution in space, which is pressure reduction, as being more important than the redistribution of load in time, which is 
impact attenuation. Right. That's, that's yes, really it also has implications for energetics and for perceptions, especially comfort. Yeah. So that's a really interesting point you make there about pressure distribution. And, and it leads nicely on to um, one of the current trends at the moment, which has only really re- – I remember you and I had this discussion a long time ago, but it's only recently been able to be done uh, from a manufacturing perspective, and that is using an anatomical last. In other words, rather than having the sort of – typical flat bottom strobel of a shoe, you can now have a contoured strobel, for want of a better word. So you theoretically, I guess, would be getting better distribution of pressure because you're getting much fuller contact of the foot shoe interface. Yeah, uh, yeah. There's uh, Martin Minches and I published a paper, I think 2011 in Footwear Science on cushioning and curvature, mm-hmm. on the relationship between how the, the softness or cushioning materials and the geometry of the cushioning surface, how that influences the pressure distribution, especially peak pressures. And in theory, there's a theory called Hertz contact theory, which describes or approximates the distribution of pressure between two compliant surfaces, like a heel and a sole, a shoe sole. And it, you know, looking at that, it kind of predicts that, well, if I change the cushioning of, or the softness of the material by 10%, or I change the curvature of the surface by 10%, they have the same effect. And that there's no way, if the only information I have is the resulting pressure distributions, I could not tell, mathematically at least, if I had reduced pressure by changing the curvature or by changing the softness of the material. So the idea that material properties and curvature or conformity have, to some extent, equivalent properties. They're mathematically inseparable. So we set out to do an experiment to figure this, to see if that was the case. And in the real world, and I'll refer you to the paper for the details, but the fact is, yes, they basically are equivalent, which means you can have a nylon plate in a soccer shoe that provides cushioning in the sense of pressure reduction by having it curved to, you know, or contoured in a way that it changes the contact here or increases the conformity between the, the plate and the surface of the foot. Yeah, so, that's, yes. that's just so interesting. I mean, I've sort of been pondering this whole concept of geometry for some time now, and I guess what really piqued my interest was when Nike started to bring out basketball boots that were obviously very rounded and very contoured, and it made complete sense to me because obviously it's going to change all the things you've just mentioned, but also it was flying in the face of, you know, particularly some of my colleagues in the world of sports medicine would say, well, if you've got rounded contours, you're going to invert your ankle, <laughs> you know, which which doesn't really make any sense when you think about how basketballers land, and they very rarely land plantar grade. So, yeah, I just I thought that was very interesting, and that fits in nicely with your comments there. Yeah, the other thing is, you know, if you're going to you're on the top of a hill and on one side there's a cliff, on the other side there's a gradual rounded slope down the hill, which side do you want to fall off of? <laughs> do you want to fall off the cliff or the sole of an edge or do you want to just roll into that nice rounded contour? And so, you know, then one of the issues in ankle sprains and other kind of issues related to the foot falling over the edge of the shoe and, uh, you know, ankle injuries in those sports that have a lot of very highly loaded lateral movements is the this edge. Mm. And I am, you know, I think they should be banned. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, but that's the, those are traditional constructions that allow, you know, that are easy to do and so on. And it's, uh, you know, p- curves are expensive in terms of tooling and processing. It's hard to, they're hard to make. Yeah, for sure. They're only coming out, you know, they're not ubiquitous. Yeah. Just a quick comment from you on, uh, so, you know, there's been some interesting work recently from guys like Chris Napier talking about the peak breaking moment in particular. He looked at only a female cohort in, in the, uh, the study he published, but relating that to running related injuries and that paper suggested that the peak breaking moment might actually be quite important. And I thought that was quite interesting because we've spent in footwear so much time looking at either motion control or cushioning, and we haven't really drilled down on some of these other quite important forces that we might be seeing. Mm-hmm. What are your thoughts yeah, on I'm that? Not from, I'm not from, I'm from, I know Chris, Chris Napier, but I'm not familiar with that particular paper. But I, you know, in general, you know, the traditional stability paradigm is busted, as you know. Mm-hmm. And it was, it was initially a, a marketing idea borrowed from classical podiatry. But they, you know, they've started putting posts and wages and stuff in the midsole, and I don't think any of them work. <laughs> <laughs> and the only things I've been able to measure when, I, when we in here measure with, you know, have a method of doing 3D motion capture that allows us to measure the motion of the foot inside the shoe. The only thing that we see that's offering any 
pronation control is inserts that we put in the inside the shoe. So and while the footwear industry has basically dumped the stability and pronation control, the uh, you know podiatrists and sports medicine people are happily treating people with inserts and orthotics and, and helping relieve the symptoms. So I think we've had this conversation before. I think we shouldn't throw out the baby with the bathwater. There's still something in there. There are still people that need some support in, in that sense, not as many as we once assumed. There are still some people who need it, and we still don't have a good way of evaluating. My approach is very simple. I kind of try and find out where I have some algorithms that locate the axis of the subtalar joint, which is highly variable, and then we figure out the, the motions around it. The next step would be if you know what Chris is doing, which is to look at the moments around that joint. And so that makes a lot of sense to me. But it's one of these things where I hope, you know, it's one of those things where I think, yeah, that's a great hypothesis. Now let's have a bunch of other labs repeat that experiment and see what they find. Yeah. So really the key take-home message from this chat we've had this morning is that podiatry is to blame. I will, I will, (laughs) I'm proud to say that, yes, I believe you believe that. (laughs) <laughs> well i have I, you know, I, I would, highest endorsement <laughs> with, some, with, some, with some pride i repeatedly trot out the fact that in 1999 i at great expense i made a video with the words motion control being flushed down a toilet <laughs> so, so i've been talking about this for quite a long time and i'm actually really relieved that the conversation's mainstream now and yeah it, it, it has been a very interesting journey but i think that approach you just mentioned of trying to figure out movement around a highly variable, highly complex foot axis, and then trying to figure out how. The people are pretty close to fully pronated when they're standing upright in relaxed yep. stance. So now it's, well, is it really about the pronation piece or is it about other things that are changing, you know, other you know, less obvious motions in the midfoot that, you know, that last 5% of the pronation, maybe, you know, that's what, there's some factors there. Or, the, you know, I gave up measuring rear foot motion a long time ago and I'm more int- I like to instead look at um, you know medial shift of the vehicle or some of those other things in the, in the midfoot that are associated with the anterior portions of the rotation of the subtalar joint motion yeah it's it's so interesting you know back in the day if you talked about arch mechanics you know you were kind of looked at askance and you know we didn't talk about arch support or trying to understand that but I think midfoot movement the focus is very much shifted from looking at rear foot movement or calcaneally version, whatever you want to look at, and trying to understand what is going on at the midfoot. And that certainly makes a lot more sense to me. I think that's... A, that's a good I, mean, the, I think rear foot motion of the calcane of the heel is a red herring. Rear foot motion of the shoe in two dimensions, which people have been measuring for a long time, including me in the past, is just nonsense. It's a more red herring than a red herring. I don't know how you to explain that, but it's just, it's just nonsense, basically. Yeah, that's uh, right. It does frustrate me that we're still in a situation where we've got people who are seeking advice, going to clinicians, podiatrists, physios, whomever, and retail, having somebody pick up their iPad and take a a grab of video just looking at the person running away from them. You know, what's the merit in that? What's the point in that? I I just don't, I don't see it. I I think it's astonishing that we allow high school students with a Saturday job in Foot Locker to make diagnoses of people's running injuries. I've been in this business for a long time and it's, and, you know, I'm not a medical professional, but even just making a biomechanical assessment, when I had the runner and the foot and everything there, all the information right here in the lab, it's a challenge. Mm. So how you do that in the store, I don't know. Of course, they haven't been doing it successfully, I think. It's, it's been more of just a, uh, as, but it's been a, a sales tool. And whatever you think about the actual mechanics and physiology and effects of the shoes, from our perspective, from the consumer perspective, they have strong preferences. Some people like something that is bulky and supportive and others don't. So at least the high school students with their Saturday jobs and Foot Locker have done a pretty good job of getting people into the shoes that they believe works for them. Yeah, but exactly. I, but, but I don't think that there's, you know, the, the biomechanical and scientific basis or medical basis for that is kind of sketchy. Yeah, unfortunately, we're locked into a, a system where support or stability is associated with heavy, stiff, unresponsive product without yeah, understanding. It doesn't have to be that. No, not at all. Not at all. Now, I'm, I'm panicking here because I told you I'd only keep you for a half hour and we're already well over that. But this may have to be a two part session because I could talk to you all day long. But I want to I did say that I wanted to talk about you and your career. And so the major thing in your career, I guess, after you left Nike was to set up your own independent biomechanics consultancy business, which is called Biomechana. Maybe you want to 
biomechanica. You know, I always get that wrong. I, I've got this. It's like a it's like a mental tick. I always call it biomechanica. It's biomechanica. I beg your pardon. Yeah. Yeah. Just just run us through how that started, Martin, and how it's evolved over the years. Well, there were things in between there, but we should probably make that another conversation, if you don't mind. Okay. Well, I'll speak with you the same time tomorrow morning. That'd be terrific, okay. Martin. Fantastic. Thank you, Simon. Talk to you then. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Bye. Thanks for joining us for the Shoe Warrior podcast by Bartold Clinical. Join us next time 